All right. So um, good morning or good afternoon uh, from wherever you're, you're watching. So my name is Alex Sanchez. I'm a urologic oncologist at, at uh, Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. Um, today, I'm going to be uh, giving kind of a, a broad overview of penile cancer evaluation and management. Um, I, I don't have any financial disclosures. My one kind of clinical disclosure is that I um, finished fellowship about a year and a half ago. Uh, my, my personal clinical experience with, with penile cancer is uh, limited, although I have an interest in managing these patients uh, from a reconstructive side and, and also from a lot of the uh, emerging clinical questions uh, in the field. Um, so for this talk, um, again, a kind of broad overview of the epidemiology of penile cancer, the surgical approach for uh, primary penile uh, cancer, the primary tumor, how to think about the evaluation and management of uh, lymph nodes, and um, overview of uh, systemic therapy, um, including perioperative therapy for uh, locally advanced penile cancer. So um, we'll start just broadly with the epidemiology of, of, um, of penile cancer. So it is a rare uh, uh, malignancy um, within the U.S. and, and Europe, uh, less than 1% of all neoplasms, um, of course, in, in men, um, about close to uh, 400 plus cancer specific deaths um, estimated in 2020 from penile cancer. Um, relevant to, to the audience, there is a higher uh, incidence of uh, penile cancer in Africa, Asia, South America, um, and this can account for up to 20% of male cancers um, um, in those regions. And as we'll talk about with some risk factors that may have to do with HPV infection and also the utilization of neonatal circumcision. Uh, the mean age of uh, penile cancer uh, presentation is about 68 uh, years old, although uh, about one in five patients will present at a younger age. Um, in terms of uh, important risk factors to know about for uh, penile cancer, I broke this up into, into different uh, buckets, inflammatory conditions, and this is a common theme of the pathophysiology of penile cancer, that inflammation may lead to changes in the squamous epithelium that really leads to the development of uh, uh, penile cancer. So inflammatory conditions like balanitis, chronic inflammation, penile injury, or tears, which could create an injury that causes inflammation and um, again, uh, causing pre-malignant lesions. Uh, we'll talk in a little bit more detail about neonatal circumcision and smegma. Uh, urinary tract infections have also been um, shown to potentially increase the risk of developing uh, penile cancer. Uh, important lifestyle factors, tobacco use. There's a, a dose-dependent relationship between tobacco use and risk of penile cancer. Um, also poor hygiene, again, having to do mostly with um, relating to uh, smegma accumulation and uh, inflammation. There are certain uh, sexually transmitted infections that are important to know about. HIV, patients with HIV have a four to eight time higher risk of squamous cell carcinoma of the, uh, of the penis. And that really has to do with likely an increased, uh, increased incidence or prevalence of HPV um, in patients with HIV and also potentially due to uh, an overall host uh, response to um, uh, difference between HIV and, and patients without HIV. Uh, patients who have HPV and a history of general warts um, have a significantly increased risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma. Again, age in general is a risk factor for developing uh, penile cancer. There are some um, other risk factors uh, like uh, treatments for psoriasis um, that could potentially directly increase the risk of uh, penile cancer, although this, um, this is a rare cause for uh, penile cancer itself. Um, I think the most important risk factor to talk about is neonatal circumcision. Um, so uh, in populations where there's a high um, utilization of neonatal circumcision, there's almost um, no incidence of uh, penile cancer. And this can be seen in Jewish and Muslim populations that have a higher rate of routine neonatal uh, circumcision. Um, if you look at um, timing of circumcision, uh, timing does matter with the biggest benefit coming, um, having uh, the circumcision uh, performed before uh, puberty. 
Um, so as you can see here, the risk, the um, odds ratio for the development of penile cancer, if you um, are overall uh, uncircumcised, um, or sorry, if, if you have um, a circumcision uh, before, uh, before puberty, you get the most benefit out of getting a circumcision as opposed to puberty after puberty or in adulthood. And then for patients who are uncircumcised, there is an increased risk of penile cancer in general, but that changes with some of the additional conditions that we talked about, like phimosis, um, which again relates to uh, inflammation and potentially accumulation of smegma and increased risk of development of infections like HPV. Uh, important to note, there may not be a decreased risk of carcinoma in site two of the penis um, uh, with utilization of, of neonatal circumcision. Uh, so phimosis, which can uh, is essentially described as um, as uh, scarring of the of the distal uh, prepuce, uh, which leads to an inability to retract. Um, uh, to visualize the glands or to appropriately clean um, the area um, in patients that um, undergo a circumcision for phimosis. If you look at the actual uh, tissue, about a third of patients will have some atypia. Um, there is an increased risk of penile cancer about seven to tenfold. And uh, phimosis is found in about 25 to 75% of patients. Um, Again, the, the kind of mechanism behind this is really to do with, with smegma uh, leading to inflammation and um, subsequent uh, phimosis. Um, so smegma, which is a cheese-like substance secreted in the inner perpetual skin glands, again, can cause inflammation, may obscure the visibility of some early cancers. There are some um, uh, essentially uh, mycobacteria that are thought to potentially secrete some carcinogenic substances this has been really mostly found in, in animal models and not, not, um, not great evidence uh, for it in, in humans, but in general, inflammation leading to, um, to changes in, in squamous epithelium. Um, most important uh, risk factor for penile cancer to, to think about is um, HPV. Um, so the prevalence of HPV in men obviously differs by um, by country uh, with higher prevalences in, in South America, Central America, Asia, and, and in Africa. Um, the prevalence of uh, HPV in patients with invasive penile cancer is about 30 to 50%, which the, with the most common types being 16, uh, 6, and 18. Um, the, the rates of HPV positivity do differ by histologic subtype, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. The important risk factors for HPV infection are um, uh, higher risk in uncircumcised men, men who have phimosis, multiple sexual partners, um, and smoking. Now let's move on to uh, talk a little bit about um, uh, pre-malignant lesions to, to think about. Um, so genital warts or condylomata chemonata um, tend to uh, present as, as due to low, low risk types of HPV, type six and 11, they still do have an increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma. And we talked about this before, men who develop general warts do have um, increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma. And this is um, visually how those patients um, uh, would look. Uh, cutaneous horn, um, these uh, sort of hypertrophic calcified lesions tend to develop over some pre-existing uh, condition. They can, at the base of, of the tumor, they can uh, have a carcinoma in situ or can develop on top of a squamous cell carcinoma. They're typically um, associated with HPV type 16 and 37. Um, usually treatment is local excision with close um, uh, evaluation of margin status at the base. Um, moving on to, to carcinoma in situ, um, erythroplasia of carat um, is uh, essentially carcinoma in situ of the glands and prepuce. Um, this is uh, to differentiate it from Bowman's disease, which we'll talk about. Um, these lesions tend to be velvety red or well demarcated. They can ulcerate and cause, cause pain. Um, tend to occur in, in older, uh, uncircumcised men. And 
Uh, most importantly, about 10 to 33% of these patients will develop invasive carcinoma. If they have an ulceration or papillary solid components, obviously that is more associated with uh, progression. And you see HPV 16 and uh, HPV 8 uh, subtypes with this kind of carcinoma in situ. Um, this uh, difference here, um, uh, this is in comparison to uh, Bowen disease, which is essentially uh, carcinoma in situ of the follicle bearing epithelium. This occurs most commonly in the shaft, uh, genital, or perineal uh, regions. It tends to be more um, solitary. Um, uh, it can be a dull red plaque with some areas of crusting and oozing. There are important differential diagnoses for these, and, and really the way to rule this out would be by doing a biopsy, but uh, eczema, psoriasis, and superficial basal cell uh, uh, carcinoma can uh, mimic this. Uh, about 5% uh, patients can develop invasive carcinoma, so less often than, um, than the previous uh, lesion, and it's associated most commonly with HPV type 16. Boinoid papillosis, um, histologically resembles carcinoma in situ, although um, it tends to present in younger men and tends to be less likely to uh, transform into malignancy. Um, some risk factors for transformation into malignancy are advanced age and immunosuppression. Uh, lichen sclerosis or balanitis erotica obliterans or BXO um, uh, is a condition that is not HPV associated, but um, can increase the risk of uh, developing squamous cell carcinoma over long periods of time. So the lag time is uh, on average about 17 years. Um, it does often co-occur with uh, penile cancer. So if you look at patients with penile cancer, about 28 to 50% will have some component of lichen sclerosis. These patients present with kind of a white atrophic um, plaque um, they can cause um, adhesions, phimosis, or meatal stenosis, needing reconstruction or uh, dilation. Um, and, and please stop me if you, if you have any questions before I move on to, um, to other sections. Um, so uh, invasive penile cancer, we'll kind of go through these different sections talking a little bit about um, uh, how do you how do you do a, a thorough evaluation and then think about um, treatment based on uh, mostly go through NCCN guidelines and using some of the European guidelines as well. Um, most commonly, these patients do present with a painless lump, although um, they can present with areas of induration, um, uh, uh, warty exophytic growth that can cause rash or bleeding. Um, patients, when uh, they present at, at, at more advanced stages, can have some uh, blood or foul smelling discharge from the tumor itself. Uh, because of compression or direct involvement of the urethra, they can have some difficulty avoiding retention. In very advanced cases, patients may have constitutional symptoms like weight loss, um, hypercalcemia, uh, cachexia um, in patients who present with metastatic disease. It's important to note that patients have uh, with penile cancer do uh, tend to have some, some delay, um, kind of historically. Um, if, if you look at some older articles from the 70s, they report a 15 to 50% delay of an average of about one year. Not sure how that is, um, uh, how, how that looks uh, in, in a more updated uh, cohort of patients, but in general, you do see some, some delay, and this may be due to patient factors or physician factors. Patients are often embarrassed or have some fear about the potential consequences of having something like penile cancer. Um, physicians may um, you know, prolong treatment with addicts, antifungals, and delay getting a biopsy. Um, so important for both uh, patient and, and general physicians to be educated on, on what these lesions look like. Um, so when uh, we're evaluating uh, uh, the primary tumor, uh, it's important to note the location. Uh, most common location is the glands and prep use. And again, this goes back to the pathophysiology of penile cancer with a lot of the inflammation and chronic inflammation really happening around the, the glands, the coronal sulcus, and the distal prep use, um, less commonly around the shaft. Um, 
important things to note on, on physical exam. What is the size, location, again, relative to uh, distal or, or proximal, how many lesions, um, other characteristics such as the morphology, papillary nodule or, or flat, and obviously relations to other structures. Does it feel mobile? Is it submucosal or um, appear to be invading the corpora? In certain patients where the physical exam is limited, such as um, obesity or um, uh, for, for various other reasons, an MRI or a CT scan can be helpful to assess the local extent of, of the primary tumor. Um, once once um, you have a potential suspicion for penile cancer, really the next step is to do a biopsy to confirm um, the histologic subtype, uh, grade, uh, other important pathologic characteristics such as vascular invasion or perineural invasion, and, and importantly, depth of invasion. This can be done through punch biopsies, um, incisional biopsies, or excisional biopsies. Um, really, excisional biopsies are reserved for patients where um, you can do a wide local excision without really much alteration in, in penile form or function. Um, Otherwise, doing an incision or incisional biopsy, incision or punch biopsy will give you the information that you need to guide for further treatment. Um, uh, the histologic subtype of squamous cell carcinoma is important. So 95% of all penile malignancies will be squamous cell carcinoma originating from the squamous epithelium, but there are different histologic subtypes within um, this group, the most common being just common um, squamous cell carcinoma, and then there are more aggressive subtypes such as the basaloid and sarcomatoid carcinoma, which tend to have a more aggressive um, uh, local spread with the basaloid spreading more uh, earlier to the inguinal lymph nodes and sarcomatoid having a predilection for vascular metastases. Um, and then there are the less aggressive subtypes like Baruchus, who really um, very rarely have any, any metastases or don't metastasize at all. Um, and the warty and papillary, which tend to have a good, good prognosis. Also additional um, uh, patterns um, to note on um, pathology would be if it's a pushing type versus a reticular uh, type of the pushing type um, of Infiltration of the tumor tends to be less aggressive and less likely to spread into lymph nodes. Um, in terms of uh, additional exams um, for patients without any palpable lymph nodes, a chest x-ray, serum labs is usually, um, usually sufficient, especially if you can get a good, good physical exam to guide your management. Any patients that have palpable lymph nodes doing a CT or an MRI to note the extent of lymphadenopathy, inguinal, and potentially into pelvic uh, or more proximal nodes. Um, and once you get into kind of bulky disease, systemic symptoms, those patients should really be assessed for um, metastatic disease. And that's where you would think about getting a bone scan and potentially a PET CT, which do have good um, sensitivity in, in patients with penile cancer. Um, staging of uh, penile cancer, this is the updated uh, eighth edition of uh, TNM staging from for uh, penile cancer, uh, some important changes are that um, T1B uh, perineural invasion has been added to uh, T1B. Uh, T2 includes uh, uh, involvement of the corpus spongiosum and T3, the corpus uh, cavernosum. And then uh, T1 was separated by location. Um, so it, it gives a specific description of um, local involvement within the glands, foreskin, shaft, um, uh, which, which uh, was not necessarily there uh, before. Um, and really, uh, this classification will help risk stratify patients specifically for uh, evaluation of their uh, nodes. Uh, for clinical evaluation of uh, inguinal nodes, um, it's important to try to get a, a good exam. Patients can, can present um, with uh, asymptomatically with, with enlarged uh, enlarged inguinal lymph nodes and in, in uh, later extents can have uh, local extension of these um, uh, lymph nodes, which can cause skin necrosis, infection. Uh, patients could actually uh, develop sepsis or have direct extension into, into iliac vessels, which could cause exsanguination. Um, 
and I'll mention this a couple of times, but the most important prognostic factor in patients with penile cancer is the presence and extent of nodal metastases. So the, that's where the exam and, and imaging when appropriate is really important for um, the management of these patients. Um, so clinically, uh, do we want to know um, are, are the lymph nodes palpable or not? Are they palpable on one or both sides? And um, are they fixed? Uh, or not, or do they have any underlying changes of the skin? And that's really where your clinical evaluation will come in. And then pathologically, you have a little bit more specifics on um, the number of inguinal lymph nodes. So if you have less than two in the unilateral and no um, uh, extranodal extension, then your uh, N1, if you have unilateral that are greater than three, um, N2, and then if you have any, any sort of um, external or um, uh, nodal extension, then you would be considered N3, uh, or if you have any pelvic lymph nodes. So um, that's information that we get from, from the surgery, surgical assessment of uh, lymph nodes. Uh, metastases, so any, any patients that have uh, visceral or uh, non-nodal metastases would be considered M1. It is rare to see patients um, present with metastatic disease. Um, it really does happen in uh, very, very late stages of penile cancer. Um, CTs, uh, including PET CT, can be helpful uh, for assessing the extent of disease. Um, usually don't recommend brain MRI, uh, except for patients that have symptoms. And some patients with advanced disease can have tumor-associated hypercalcemia, so it's important to check uh, labs as this can cause uh, systemic symptoms like altered mental status. Um, so if there are no uh, questions or, or comments, we'll uh, move on to uh, surgical approach uh, of the primary tumor. Um, and this, this really uh, depends on, on appropriate pathologic staging. So um, we'll kind of discuss the options based on uh, pathologic stage for patients that have carcinoma in situ or uh, TA disease. Um, these are the, the different options for uh, treatment. We'll talk a little bit about uh, topical therapy. So the two uh, common drugs, creams that are used are 5-fluorouracil uh, and amiquimod. Um, they are uh, both used at a different frequency for about four to six weeks. The difficulty with these medications is that it's, it's um, difficult to adhere to and can also cause some local toxicity, um, which can be managed uh, by less frequent applications. So um, you know, physicians have to be uh, seeing these patients frequently to make sure that they're adhering to their treatment and um, addressing any local toxicity. Most of the studies looking at the efficacy of, of this and uh, patients with, uh, with uh, CIS mostly um, show that there is a complete response rate of about 60%, although again, um, these all tend to be uh, pretty small, um, pretty small studies. Um, once we get into uh, T1 disease, um, this is where we start to stratify uh, by risk. Really patients that have grade one or two without lymphovascular invasion or um, uh, perineural invasion, uh, do you still have some, some options that we saw for CIS and TA, whereas um, treatment of grade three to four or patients with lymphovascular invasion or perineural invasion are treated a little bit more aggressively. Um, we talk about laser therapy. There are different types of lasers that can be used. Um, you can use CO2, uh, YAC laser, KTP laser. Um, the kind of um, principle behind these is that they superficially uh, burn the cancer without um, uh, causing significant uh, defects. Um, in the operating room, we usually use 3 to 5% acetic acid to really highlight um, the areas that need to be lasered. And usually the areas of CIS um, will turn white. Um, you do have to have a smoke evacuator because the HPV particles in these cases can be aerosolized. Uh, sometimes we'll use N95 masks as well um, during these cases. Um, the downsides of, of using laser therapy are, uh, as you would expect, higher rates of local recurrence compared to partial phenectomy, but uh, depending on the stage, not necessarily compromising um, survival. So 
um, in, in some small series, a uh, five-year recurrence-free survival um, on average is about 46% and depends on, um, on, the, on the primary stage of the tumor. Um, other options for uh, penile organ sparing surgery are uh, wide local excision. So in patients that have um, just uh, CIS, uh, TA of uh, the prepuce, um, distal prepuce, a circumcision may be, may be adequate for patients that have lesions on the shaft um, of the penis, um, a complete excision of the shaft. And this is an example of of a patient here on the right uh, from a recent article in 2016 where the patient had essentially all his shaft um, skin removed and then skin grafted. Um, for patients that have CIS of, of the um, glands, can do glands uh, resurfacing. Um, and I'll show you a, a picture of that. Most surgery is uh, used by dermatologists essentially to take small sections of uh, um, until you get to a point where the margins are negative and the whole goal is to preserve as much uh, normal tissue as possible. That's also an option for, for select patients, mostly in patients that have proximal small lesions and you're trying to preserve um, that area. Um, for, uh, there's a recent study in uh, National Cancer uh, Database, which looked at kind of organ sparing uh, surgery in patients with T1 or T2 disease. So this does include some um, uh, higher, higher grade disease, um, but patients that had wide local excisions, most surgery uh, compared to total or partial penectomy actually had uh, similar, similar outcomes. Um, so again, I think it's important uh, to consider patients based on um, their pathologic evaluation and also their willingness to undergo close follow-up as there are higher risk of, of recurrences with uh, penile organ sparing surgery. Um, other, uh, this is an example of glands resurfacing um, where uh, basically you can um, uh, essentially shave off the, all the, the skin on the glands itself and then cover with uh, skin graft. Um, other options are to do a partial or complete glandsectomy for patients who have disease of the glands. And again, there's a higher risk of uh, potential recurrence, uh, local recurrence, without really compromising long-term oncologic outcomes. This is another couple of examples of, of how to manage uh, different areas of the glands. So if you have proximal uh, involvement of the glands close to the um, uh, coronal sulcus, uh, you can resect that area and bring up the residual um, uh, foreskin. Um, if you have just a small segment of the glands that's involved, again, you can use a perpetual uh, flap to cover that area while preserving the remainder of the, of the glands itself. Uh, once patients have uh, higher stage disease, so T2 or greater, um, again, important to note the extent of the disease and, and, uh, and location for patients who have uh, distal disease. Um, they can still be a candidate for partial penectomy. And as we talked about, this is the most common area where uh, squamous cell carcinoma actually arises. Um, so uh, about 77% of, of patients will be amenable uh, for a partial penectomy. And really the goals of this surgery and, and, and how you would choose patients for this are um, whether or not you can maintain enough penile length for um, standing uh, for urination and also for sexual function. So um, usually at least three, four centimeters of uh, penile length um, is, is adequate. Uh, as with other penile sparing surgeries, there is a higher risk of local recurrences um, and specific to this type of surgery, a risk of medial stenosis. On the right, there's an example of how, how this is done, essentially trying to maintain a margin of um, around one centimeter, depending on the grade of the tumor. Uh, historically, we've always talked about two centimeters, but that doesn't seem to be um, needed based on um, recent studies in patients with lower grade tumors, uh, about a half a centimeter seems adequate, and patients with higher grade tumors, a centimeter is adequate. Um, once the, the corpora essentially are, are divided, the urethra is preserved and spatulated um, uh, uh, dorsally. 
um, and then uh, a neomiatus is created, um, as you can see here. Um, and, and again, the most important thing to counsel patients on is the rates of uh, meatal stenosis, which are about four to four to ten percent. And patients that have more advanced or more proximal disease, a total penectomy is required. So you take the corpora all, all the way down to the pubic bone until you get a negative margin. Uh, corpora are oversewn, and the urethra is uh, isolated and um, isolated, spatulated, and brought through the uh, perineum for a perineal urethrostomy. Um, this, this is obviously a life-changing procedure for patients. It's important to uh, make sure that psychologically um, these, these patients are okay with, uh, with undergoing the surgery and provide them with any support um, that they uh, may need and ensure that they have some, some psychological support um, at home uh, as well. Um, if there aren't any questions about treating uh, the primary tumor, um, we'll move on to um, evaluation and management of inguinal lymph nodes. Um, so th the natural history of, of uh, penile cancer and, and thinking about inguinal lymph nodes um, is very important. Uh, as we mentioned before, some patients can present with their primary tumor where it's um, infected or foul smelling. So some patients may have reactive uh, lymphadenopathy. Um, it's important to assess whether or not these lymph nodes are real. So um, reevaluating the patient 46 weeks after antibiotics um, is important. Um, uh, about 30 to 60%, depending on the um, stage of the primary tumor and grade, can have regional metastatic disease, and this tends to be bilateral. Um, so uh, usually do not recommend uh, a unilateral uh, lymph node dissection. Um, except in, in certain cases of recurrent disease. Um, this is probably one of the most important takeaway points from, um, from this talk, and really it's that the presence of lymph node metastases is really a driver of overall survival for these patients. So patients that have um, no inguinal metastases have a pretty good five-year survival, 85 to 100%. But once you look at patients that have um, uh, positive pelvic lymph nodes, it goes down to zero to 17%. So very important to adequately assess um, lymph node status in these patients and, and um, uh, come up with a treatment plan appropriate for, for their stage. Um, so breaking this up in different clinical scenarios. So first let's talk about non-palpable inguinal lymph nodes. So essentially, um, what is recommended is um, risk stratification based on, on risk, and the risk is, um, is uh, derived from the primary tumor itself. So patients that have uh, TIS, TA, or T, uh, T1A, so these are patients with um, essentially no lymphovascular invasion, no um, perineural invasion, um, can be uh, observed on surveillance, and their risk of um, of lymph node metastases is uh, zero to seven percent. Um, in patients who have higher risk, um, meaning T1B or, or higher, um, it is recommended that we assess for um, involvement of inguinal lymph nodes initially done with imaging, and then depending on the expertise of your site, uh, dynamic sentinel lymph node biopsy has been improved in um, certain uh, sites of expertise, but otherwise uh, performing uh, bilateral, starting with a bilateral superficial inguinal dissection uh, bilaterally uh, would be the next, next step. Um, so the management of non-pupable uh, inguinal lymph nodes is, it remains uh, somewhat controversial. Uh, the reason is that there are a small number of studies. Um, all the data is, is uh, retrospective. Um, even in patients that have a negative physical exam, uh, as many as 20% of patients can have uh, nodal metastases. And again, this is um, dependent on the grade and primary tumor stage. Um, most importantly, what happens if you just wait until those patients kind of declare themselves? Dr. Um, McDougall um, looked at five-year survival for patients who had a prophylactic lymph node dissection, meaning in the non-palpable inguinal lymph node stage versus when they declared themselves uh, later with palpable lymph nodes. And as you can imagine, their survival was significantly better if they had the prophylactic uh, lymph node dissection, which argues for 
um, earlier identification of these uh, lymph node involvement. For patients that have palpable lymph nodes, it's important to differentiate them uh, based on size. So um, based on less than four centimeters or greater, based on laterality, either unilateral or bilateral, and based on whether or not they are uh, bulky, fixed, or causing any changes to the underlying skin. So for patients that have um, unilateral lymph nodes that are mobile, um, less than four centimeters, we think again about their primary lesion. If the lesion is uh, low risk, then we can think about doing an ultrasound guided percutaneous biopsy. Um, if that is negative, still consider doing an excisional biopsy of whatever node is there. Um, if it's positive at all, or the excisional biopsy is positive, then, then doing an inguinal lymph node dissection, again, depending on uh, the patient, considering uh, new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy. If you have a high risk primary lesion, then moving straight towards and uh, straight to uh, inguinal lymph node dissection, and this would be uh, again bilateral. For patients that have a greater than four centimeter fixed um, or bilateral lymph nodes, um, it would be important to consider uh, neoadjuvant therapy followed by um, uh, surgery in patients who have a good response. This is a summary essentially of. of of that algorithm, so patients with palpable, bulky inguinal lymph nodes who have, um, uh, who have fixed or large or bilateral lymph nodes should undergo a percutaneous lymph node biopsy um, to assess for um, uh, the presence of disease. If that is present, then consideration for uh, new adjuvant therapy uh, followed by uh, surgery. Um, See if there's anything else uh, here in patients who have negative biopsies. Um, it, it's still considered um, standard of care to go and try to do an excisional biopsy to confirm that these lymph nodes are indeed uh, indeed negative. So um, quickly, just to talk about uh, a inguinal lymph node dissection. So patients are uh, positioned in the prone uh, frog-like uh, position. Uh, during an, doing an open dissection, we want to develop thick skin flaps. Some of the morbidity that comes from this procedure itself comes from uh, impact of this uh, skin flap and potential necrosis. Um, uh, handling and, and developing a good thick uh, skin flap is, is essential to preventing complications. Um, the borders of your inguinal lymph node dissection, superiorly so of the inguinal ligament, laterally the sartorius muscle, medially the adductor longus, and imperially the base of the femoral um, triangle. Um, this is an image here um, showing the superficial nodes basically above the fascia lata and then the deep nodes below the, the fascia lata. Um, these days we try to preserve the saphenous vein and don't usually do a sartorius um, a flap. I think that's more institutional uh, dependent. And um, uh, identify the femoral artery and vein, and there's no need to go uh, posterior to the to the nerve, uh, to the femoral nerve. Um, there has been a growing interest in performing this procedure uh, robotically, um, given that uh, a lot of the comorbidities that come from this procedure are really related to the local uh, skin flap, um, as well as um, edema uh, related to to the inguinal lymph node dissection. Um, so there are several studies. This is just one example coming from um, uh, MD Anderson, where they actually did a great job at uh, evaluating uh, how good of a resection you can do robotically. And, and then at the end of the case, actually opening, doing a traditional open incision and assessing how many lymph nodes would have been missed by doing a robotic approach. And at least in, in, um, in this small cohort, 95% of, uh, of uh, nodes that were identified robotically um, uh, would have been identified, um, sorry, 95% uh, of the nodes that would have been identified open were identified robotically. Patients that have pelvic lymph nodes, um, the management of those patients initially involves um, uh, a percutaneous biopsy. This is if they present with pelvic lymph nodes at uh, presentation. Um, if there are surgical candidates considering new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by 
uh, surgery, and this would involve inguinal and pelvic lymph node uh, dissection in patients that are non-surgical candidates of consideration for uh, chemo radiation. Um, I know we're running a little bit low on time. I'll kind of quickly go through this. So patients um, do have a risk of, of relapse after uh, local regional management of penile cancer. Uh, the relapse is really highest within the first, first three years. Um, so it's important to have close follow-up for these patients and most importantly to do physical exams. The late, late relapses can occur um, uh, greater than five years out. Um, can I skip that? The, uh, management of, of relapse really depends on uh, the location and uh, stage and overall uh, performance status of the patient. If they have a local recurrence in the inguinal region, um, patients can uh, end up undergoing an inguinal lymph node dissection. This is where you would potentially consider doing uh, just one side um, if they had never had a lymph node dissection before. If they had had a prior inguinal lymph node dissection or radiation therapy, um, then considering uh, chemotherapy followed by inguinal lymph node dissection, uh, surgery alone, or chemo radiation. So briefly, uh, systemic therapy, which unfortunately we don't have a ton to, to, to discuss here. Um, in neoadjuvant therapy, the recommended regimen is uh, paclitaxel, iphosphamide, and cisplatinum. Um, that provides a, about a 50% uh, response rate. This comes from a study that was published in JCO in 2010 from MD Anderson. Um, these patients with uh, bulky uh, adenopathy uh, were treated with uh, TIP and had about a 50% response rate. Uh, about 70% of patients ended up with subsequent surgery. Um, about 10% of patients had a, a pathologic complete response, meaning no residual disease. Not surprisingly, if patients had a response radiographically or pathologically, they had improved survival. Um, so this is really what would be considered the standard of care for neoadjuvant therapy. And even adjuvant therapy, um, sort of extrapolating from this new adjuvant study, other treatments from an adjuvant therapy standpoint, 5 FU and cisplatinum, but their overall response rate is actually lower um, for, for that regimen compared to TIP. Um, in terms of adjuvant radiation therapy, uh, you can consider that for patients who have uh, viable who have extra nodal disease or bilateral nodes noted on, on um, surgical resection. Um, I, I would say there's no clear consensus on adjuvant radiation therapy, but something that is being uh, studied in, in a study that I'll mention uh, briefly. For patients that have metastatic disease, um, again, TIP is a preferred regimen followed by uh, 5 fu and cisplatinum as first line. For second line, really a clinical trial is preserved, uh, preferred for patients who have genomic sequencing and are noted to have um, uh, MSI high or uh, MMR uh, mutations. Uh, pembrolizumab uh, could be utilized, uh, but this is an area in need of uh, further research. Um, probably the most important ongoing trial, which is national and international at this point, led by Dr. Curtis Petaway um, and other folks at MD Anderson, is looking at the management of clinically node positive uh, patients with squamous cell carcinoma, and they're randomizing patients to inguinal lymph node dissection alone versus uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy uh, versus neoadjuvant um, chemoradiotherapy um, with different, different regimens. Um, and risk stratifying patients by intermediate or high risk. And then uh, once they have a pathology, if they have positive pelvic lymph nodes, they're also um, randomized into a separate group where they have their no surgery, pelvic lymph node dissection, or potentially uh, chemo radiation therapy. So I think this trial will give us a lot of really good information as to how to manage um, these patients. Just briefly on penile cancer prevention, obviously we talked about circumcision, general hygiene, um, for HPV infection, um, utilization of condoms. Um, there are two vaccines that are available for the prevention of some of the oncogenic uh, types of uh, penile cancer available to men and, and women. Obviously tobacco use, which is a important lifestyle factor. And just to, to summarize this uh, kind of broad overview, overview, penile cancer is um, aggressive, um, can 
significantly shorten the patient's life and uh, importantly also uh, impact their quality of life. Um, accurate staging and, and thoughtful evaluation of patients can help determine whether or not they're good candidates for penile organ preserving therapy and then how to manage their uh, inguinal lymph nodes. And then really future clinical trials will help us shed light on, on how we're going to incorporate chemotherapy and radiation into uh, the treatment of um, most important clinical node positive disease. Um, so I can take, I know it's a little bit late, uh, we started a little bit late, but uh, I can take any questions. I also have some questions for the audience if nobody has questions for me, uh, but I'm happy to take any questions that anybody has. Yeah, Dr. Do you deal with penile cancer in your practice, Dr. Curia? Or Dr. Nasanga? Hello, Dr. Curia, online. Hello. Yeah, we we used to see a lot of penal cancer earlier, but mm -hmm. in the last five years, we have actually seen one case only that declined surgery and went away. So I don't know what suddenly has happened. Either the hygiene has improved or the human papilloma virus in the population has gone low. We see very few cases these days. If any, in the last five years, in fact, we have seen only one who declined wow. surgery. Thank and, you. And when, when you do see those cases, what, what is their presentation like? Is it more early or later stage? They invariably present with late stage with obvious uh, mm -hmm. inguinal metastasis and even pelvic metastasis. Okay. Late presentation was the 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 the, the rule. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's interesting that that you've seen a trend of a decrease in in these cases. Um, yeah, it was I, it was interesting, you know, reading some of the original articles looking at delay in in presentation and you know, reports of delay of a year in, in presentation for these patients. I wonder how that differs now, but uh, I think still, at least for patients that I've seen in my training and recently in my practice, um, we still see patients with advanced disease um, coming in, so. All right, any other questions, concerns? Um, it looks like Dr. Nemugeni raised her hand. Yes, please. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Sanchez, for the presentation. Um, maybe to contribute on what Mr. Kiria has said, probably that there is a positive effect on the on the on the prevalence of, uh, on what we see in uh, penile cancer, probably due to safe male circumcision that, is being, that has been done recently in Uganda. Mm -hmm. Could that have an effect? Maybe Mr. Kiria could comment on that. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, we know from literature that prevention of penile cancer, if it is to be done by circumcision, it has to be early in life, neonatal circumcision. Safe male circumcision is mainly being practiced for adults and some adolescent boys. So unless we have to change our thinking that even late circumcision has a, a, a positive impact in prevention, unless we change our thinking that way. But if, if we stick to the old school of thought that it is early circumcisional in life, neonatal most times that is preventive, 
then circumcision may have no effect. That, those are my thoughts. It's just a guess. I've not subjected it to any form of science. Thank you. Yeah, those are great thoughts. It'd be, it'd be interesting to look at the trend of, of uh, HPV infections uh, because you're right, if, if it's a case that there's more circumcision mostly after puberty and in adulthood, that really shouldn't change the, the risk for penile cancer. Um, so I wonder if there's more of a difference in the rates of HPV infection that have caused differences. Hello, hello. Yes. yes, thank you for the talk. It was a good talk. Um, Kiri and Josephine are in the east of Uganda and I'm based in central Uganda, where the capital is. So I think mm -hmm. most patients are referred centrally and we still see quite a lot. And the presentation is late. And uh, these are patients maybe even who, who come so that they can go ahead and have some chemotherapy at our cancer institute. So we are still seeing quite a lot. Even this week, we, we got a patient. And uh, maybe if, if you say that um, the, 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 what? the incidence is dropping, maybe it's because of the smoking rate. People smoking maybe have gone down, they are less, and the hygiene may be a bit improved. Maybe that may contribute to the decrease that is coming up in other areas. But we still see because everybody refers centrally to the National Referral Hospital. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you everyone for the for the opportunity to, to present today. I, as, as I kind of mentioned, this was a little bit of a broad overview. I'd be happy to spend some time focusing more on surgery or, or um, you know, some of the uh, details of, you know, preserving surgery or systemic therapy in, in the future. But um, thank you for the opportunity and um, happy to learn from you as well. So thank you very much. Thanks, Katie. Yeah, thank you so much. Welcome. <coughs> I really appreciated you presenting. Um, and I'll um, I'll email you about other lecture opportunities. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Very much. Yeah, thank Have you so much. Thank you.